And I remember last time I was here, a very good friend of mine down the front here, Pastor Miller too. And uh, we're going to pray. You've got a daughter that's not well right now. And uh, we've shared some special times getting around. And he's a great man. I've enjoyed all the people I've got to know. Pastor Chris is my friend there. And Pastor Tim and, and uh, all of you guys. It's a, this is a great church. You look so sharp. I feel like a slob. I mean, our church is so casual. We're just so casual. We just get in hoodies and hats back the front and coloured shoes and all that. Here, everyone's like, praise God. I like it. I like it. There's a touch of the Holy Ghost here. And uh, I would have put on a tie, but I don't think I own one anymore. And uh, I do have them back home. But anyway, here I'm with a T-shirt. Can you believe that? A T-shirt. Here's people here. They've got immaculate. Look at, look at this man sitting on the front. Just like a million dollars, sir. And the ladies. What is it? Is there something? Do you ladies take special beauty pills or something? What is it? You're all so good looking and you all dress so beautifully. What, what, what is this? Somebody told me that the, the prettiest ladies in the whole of California, you'll find them in this church today. And all the, all the husbands said, now turn to your wife and say, I'll buy you a new dress and a pair of shoes for that. My wife's not here, so I can just sort of say that. By the way, we, this year we've got a few things we're doing. Um, Musicians can have a rest. You can have a rest. Good job, bro. Well done. The musicians are incredible. Incredible. What a church. What a church. This must be the greatest church in the world. You must have the best pastor in the world. Wow. There are churches everywhere. Amsterdam. How many people are here from Holland? The Klompen, yeah, clogs, yeah. windmills. <laughs> How many people here from Australia? Praise God, here I am. <laughs> How many from England? None. How many from Mexico? <laughs> Gloria a Dios. Jesus said, tell Signor, Buenos, not quite Tardis. <laughs> Spanish is a great language. I'd like, I'm going to have to learn. Pastor, I've been, I've been in so many, with so many Latino people this last few weeks that I've changed my name to Timos Holos. <laughs> so it's my new name. Amen. Oh, I was talking to Benny Perez and I've been with... Pastor Al Valdez and Pastor Sergio Delamore and Pastor Josiah Silver and all the guys. And I've been with my friends, um, Miguel, and every second guy's Jose. How many Jose's? All the Jose's, lift your hand. <laughs> Not many. What's happening? How many Miguel's? How many with the surname Rodriguez? just great names they're sort of Rodriguez Valdez it's like mine's Hall <laughs> by the way if you want to follow what we're doing um, my Instagram is at Pastor Tim Hall but watch out because I've got a whole lot of people putting fakes up there I've got a whole bunch of fakes somebody said you've made it when you've got fakes and I've had seven I think <laughs> seven or eight try, trying to get money out of people and putting up my pictures and uh, I've got a, a good guy, he's an Asian guy on my staff, and he, I just put him onto it, and he just gets him out. But it's at Pastor Tim Hall. How many are on Instagram? Well, just put it straight in now. Don't mess around, just at Pastor Tim Hall. And it's not one of the fake ones that's got other stuff, it's just at Pastor Tim Hall. And uh, by all means, please follow us, we'd love that. And the reason I'm saying that today is that my son's got more followers than me, and I'm trying to lift him. The number. He's, he's got 11,000. I'm just trying to break 10,000. How many have you got, Pastor? You'd have lots. 20, 30, 40,000, 100,000. Anyway, 
Today's a significant day. Someone say it's a significant day. Pentecost. I, uh, I know I have a word from the Lord today. Got something from the Lord to share. And uh, Father, would you anoint your word today? Thank you. Thank you for the strength of your presence and power that's in this house. And I pray that not one word would be wasted now, that you do something very strong, significant. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody said. I was, uh, last year, we did a number of crusades last year. We, this year we've got big ones. We're going into Mozambique. Um, I'm expecting they'll be big crusade, maybe 200,000 people per night there. And then we're going up into northern Uganda with... Uh, uh, refugees, with uh, Sudanese refugees from the war, and I'm going with professional footballers from England, and uh, they're going to do clinics in the day with, with them all, and then at night we're going to have big crusade meetings, so we'll use the soccer to really attract a lot of things and get a centre point, and then we'll have a big, big crusade meeting with those refugees, there's a million of them, so who knows, we might have 100,000 in there or more, and it's the day to really... We haven't got long, I don't think. Everything's moving at a very, very rapid rate. In fact, it's accelerated. I've watched the last five years an acceleration. That I, that's, yeah, you're seeing stuff happen before your eyes. I was, uh, last year, we were in, we did four big crusades, India, the Philippines, Vanuatu and New Guinea, all in the space of about five weeks. And uh, I was tired by the end. I was a little bit weary in well-doing. And I got before the Lord and I actually didn't want to preach. I just felt like, man, I feel tired. Like just, God, I'm, I'm weary and well-doing. And the Lord took me to the book of Revelation and he talked to me about the church at Ephesus. And he said, Tim, this is where you're at. And he said, I know your works. You're working hard. I said, Lord, I'm working hard. And he said, you're patient. I said, I'm trying to be. I don't like patience don't like learning patience but I'm doing my best and I felt like he was just ticking the boxes he said but I got something against you right now I said what's that he said you've lost that intimacy of your first love with me you're busy you're doing it but that edge that sharp Holy Ghost edge that sense that I felt in the atmosphere this morning the just that touch that edge is missing intimate place, that place of strong connection. And I wasn't doing anything wrong. I didn't feel I was in sin or anything, but just the blade was a little bit blunt. The edge of the axe of intimacy. And he talked to me. He said, I want you to take some time out. And so I took three months. He said, I want you to take three months out. Don't travel overseas for three months. So I didn't. I did a few meetings around because I've got a staff and I had to keep the finances going for, for the staff. And uh, when you pay people, they like to get paid. How many know that? And, you know, you've got to cover your costs and your expenses and everything else. So I did a little bit, a little bit and, uh, but very little in terms of traveling and preaching. But every day I just set myself to go out in the bush, which I've always done over the years. I like to go away into the mountains. I like to get aside with the Lord and seek his face and... In the old days, I used to like to spend three weeks out there, right up in the outback of Australia, fast and pray, get up in a tent there and get up in the morning and all day just seek God. Now I no longer would use a tent. Now it's like a, a nice four-star chalet or something out there. Um, you know, you get soft. I'm 70 this year. You've got to look after yourself. So you've got to look after yourself a little bit. Plus, I'm a little bit fat. Sleeping in a tent on, a, on the ground is not really... Had enough of that. No more of that. That's, that's no fun. But every day I was going out and I was sort of felt, I felt the Lord say, give me at least four hours a day. And so I was just getting out there and seeking the face of God, seeking the face of God. And he started to talk to me. He said, I don't want you to come out here and just pray. I want you to come out here and consciously go into the throne room and I preach a lot on the throne room, the difference between token prayer and throne room prayer. And he was saying, I want you to come into the throne room, into the intimate place with me and seek me. 
And I was doing that every day, just out there crying out to God, seeking God. It was, and the more you pray, the more you're addicted to prayer. It becomes an addiction. You feel at the end of the day, if you haven't spent time in his word or in prayer, you feel like there's something wrong. You can't sort of, you just you feel like half your day, something's wrong. And uh, during that time, he began to stir me about California. Every day, I was finding myself praying for California. He said, I'm about to do a big thing in California. And I felt the Lord say, California's under siege right now. In the spirit realm, it's under siege. There's... It, Right now in California, it's almost like everything that's anti-God's getting pushed. Everything anti-Bible seems to be on the agenda. And that's not how it ought to be. How many know that California belongs to God? I mean, it belongs to God. I'll say it again. California belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the devil. It belongs to God. This state is God's state. Amen? Amen. And uh, so as I was praying, he began to speak to me and said, there's something going to come out of California, something powerful. It took me into Ezekiel, and at the start of Ezekiel, it describes a cloud coming, a wind and a cloud, and in the cloud is fire. And then Ezekiel was taken into the throne room and saw Jesus on the throne. And he said, Tim, there's a whole bunch of people in California that are frustrated there's a whole lot of people that aren't prepared to let the nation go under. I think if we realize how hard forces are working right now to bring about the end of civilization as we know it, I think if we understood how close we are to the things prophesied in the book of Revelation, the world is moving, it's on this course, I think, so fast right now. And yet, God always has men and women that take a stand. And he said, there's people that are going to take a stand like they've never taken before. And he said, there are people that are not just going to pray, but there are people who are going to go into the throne room to touch me. People that are not content for just prayer, but are coming, going to come into the place of ultimate dominion, ultimate authority, ultimate holiness, and ultimate power. Because when we spend time, now I'm starting to preach now, I'm loosening up now. When we go into the throne room of Almighty God to spend time and to wait on God, we will imbibe into our lives all that's there. The things of the throne room will become our nature. The more time we spend in the presence of Jesus, the more we will imbibe him and his glory. And so he took me into the throne room. I started to do a fresh study and I looked at Ezekiel's experience in the throne room, what he saw. Well, he saw Jesus sitting on the throne, blazing bronze from the waist down. He was bronze like a furnace. Jesus is not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. We get these pathetic pictures of Jesus like pasty white face nursing a little lamb. I don't even think he necessarily was really that white because his auntie, Ruth, somewhere back there, she's jet black. So I think that if we really saw Jesus and we'd say, where are you from? We'd think he was Hispanic. Nice brown, nice brown colour. What do you think? Everybody said? It's, it's a mixed crowd on this one. But I don't think he's like... I think he was a carpenter. Is he out there chopping wood? He's out in the sun. He's, he probably looked like Tim. I don't think he was just this. And he's certainly not now. John saw him in his glory and fell on his feet as a dead man. Fear not. John, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. 
When Ezekiel saw him, he was blazing fire. To be in his presence right now and to spend time in the throne room is to catch that fire. Bible says in Daniel, Daniel describes the throne room. He says from under the throne flows liquid fire. John was taken, the Spirit of God said, come up here, John. Come and see. And he took him in the Spirit and he lifted him up into the throne room. And he saw the glory of God. Daniel saw it. Isaiah, the Bible says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. It's a place of ultimate holiness. It's not a place you walk in casually. It's not a place you walk in as a compromiser. Uh, I'm in a relationship that's not right. You know, I'm morally not really living right, but I worship on Sunday and God understands. I don't know, I've read somewhere that the wages of sin haven't changed. I don't think you walk into the throne room like casual with a big Cuban cigar hanging out of your mouth or a bottle of Jack in the hand. I think it's a place of extreme holiness and it can only be entered by blood, the precious blood of the Lamb of God. You do not enter it casually. You don't come in there, oh yeah. You enter... With humbleness, humility, clean hands, pure heart. Because it's so holy that the seraphim, the burning ones, fly around that place. Flashing around, blazing with light, the seraphim. And they shield their eyes. They have six wings and with two they shield their eyes. So they uh, cannot look upon the glory, but the beautiful thing is that you and I can. Because now with unveiled face, we can look into the glory. And not only can we look into the glory, we can imbibe it. But not only can we imbibe it, the Bible says the fullness of Almighty God indwells us. He wants us to, it to shine out from us. Arise and shine, your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Gross darkness shall cover the earth and it's covering the earth. Gross darkness and evil, the people. But the Lord shall arise upon you and his glory shall be seen upon you. The Bible says the Lord shall arise upon you. The word arise in the Hebrew means radiate beams of divine light out from you. God is actually raising up people now that are not content with just where they are right now, but would say, Father, I am coming into the throne room. I'm setting myself into a new place of prayer. I'm going to press in now because I want to catch everything that's on you, everything that's in the throne room. I want your glory on me. I want your holiness. I want to live in intimacy with you. I want to live in a clean, strong place of power. The Bible says of the seraphim, they cover their feet with two of their wings. And I think it's because they are unable to put their feet down into the heat of the liquid fire that's out from under the throne. But my Bible says we have bold access in there by the blood of Jesus. I look at the scriptures, it seems to contradict. How many know it doesn't? The Bible says that we have been raised together with him, seated together with him, quickened, raised, raised out of sin, raised out of every crazy thing. How many people have been raised out of crazy stuff beside me? God raised me out of craziness at 26 years of age. I've been walking with him from that day. I was pastoring 12 months later. Didn't know what I was doing, but I was pastoring. (laughs) The Bible says you have been quickened together with him, raised together with him, and seated together with him. 
seated with him. Where? In heavenly places, far above all rule, principality, power and dominion. He's put all things under his feet, which is the church, the fullness of him that filleth all and in all. We're not striving to get into some place. We've got to learn to live from that place. But he says we're already there because he's in you. How many would you say Jesus is in me? How many would say that I'm in him? Jesus in you, you in him. He's here in you, you're there in him. But we can then go into the throne room consciously with a determination to be in there experientially. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a deliberate setting of ourselves to take time to get into the ultimate place in the universe. This is the place where the Father turned to the Son and said, let us make a universe. This is where the Father turned to the Son and said, Son, get ready to go down there. This is the room where he named your name before the foundation of the earth. This is the room, this is the very place where the Father said to the Holy Spirit, they're ready The day of Pentecost has fully come. Go now. You and I have got bold access to go into that place where the greatest eternal decisions that have ever been made are made. You actually have an invitation to go in there and transact eternal business with him. And you've got bold access. How do people know the call of God? How do great things happen for God? They happen because someone says, I'm going to spend time in there. I'm I'm going in there. So many people come out of seasons with God in the holy place. And they go in there and say, I'm not coming out until something happens. T.L. and Daisy Osmond, great preachers, went to India and failed. People would come and they'd say, how come you say the Bible is the holy book? We say the Quran or the, the, the Vedas or the sacred writings. They'd say, no, the Bible is. They'd say, prove it. And they couldn't. They came back. T.L. Osman locked himself away, locked himself in a place for 21 days, seeking God hour after hour. And God met him, came into the room and he said, as I've been with Wigglesworth, as I've been with Price, So I'll be with you. No demon will stand against you the rest of your life. And within a short space of time, he was preaching to the biggest crowds out in the third world that had ever been seen. Tommy Hicks, who saw South America break into such a revival move, fasted and prayed. Two 40-day fasts, locked away with God, seeking God. And God picked him up, took him to Mr. Perron, the president of the nation, through a remarkable miracle. Peron was healed. Mr. Peron was healed. And he opened the door and said, my nation's at your feet. And he began to minister to the biggest crowds that have been seen in the history of the church. Crowds in Argentina, so big, so big, that they had to bring crutches and sticks in there. They had to bring tractor trailers and trucks by the dozen to cart away the sticks and crutches and wheelchairs discarded all over the fields. I look at some of the great men in this country that have moved so mightily in God. I used to preach in Houston at a church that belonged to a man called Raymond T. Ritchie. Not everybody knows him, but he was a mighty evangelist who had at one crusade in Houston, Texas. So many people were healed that they had a parade through the streets, about 10 or a dozen wide that ran for 13 blocks. Crutches and sticks. In South Africa, Branham and Bosworth carried out a crusade in South Africa that took a fleet of trucks to cart away the sticks and crutches by the hundreds and hundreds. There are dimensions of what God... God wants to do something in California. God wants to do something in America. Where are the people here that would say, Jesus, somewhere, there's got to rise up a church in California... Maybe more than one that are suddenly beginning to speak out and carry and declare something, carrying something, 
people coming to go, what have you got? What have you got? I understand you're moving into the prayer room now. This is the time for people that want something greater. This is a time for people here that would say, Jesus, I am not satisfied. Have you ever had that feeling of unsatisfied satisfaction? You're satisfied, but you're not. You've got to have more. You've got to have more. Something within you says, if I don't, I have people say, are you going to retire? I say, and do what? Get a cat. (laughs) Grow tomatoes. Read the newspaper and do the Sudoku. Well, I got breath. I want to use it. While I can get around, I'm going to get around. They say, what about if you get killed doing it? Bad luck. God's looking for people. He's looking, he's looking to raise a mighty army of people that are not just... You know, most Christians today are so apathetic and so sleepy that they don't even realize that if they don't stand up, they're going to get swallowed up. The body of Christ doesn't wake up in America, it'll get swallowed. So that's just words. That's not just words. Everything's being geared to swallow the church. The throne room, it's a place of holiness and power. It's a place of lightnings and thunder. Liquid fire, when the Lord speaks, there's a thundering. I I heard the Lord say, Tim, I want to take you from being a preacher to a thunderer. George Whitfield, he said, I'm here to thunder the word. I shared a word over pastor today. He's a man of God. He's a powerful man of God. But we, we prayed with him this morning. The power of God was strong. And I felt a word that he's going to thunder with a voice that's going to be so clear that it's going to impact way beyond where it already has. It's t- what America needs right now, it needs voices to rise up as a clear car- clarion trumpet sound that cut through the air and shake and change to a great degree in this country. We stand back and watch. We see great ministries in this country with opportunities on TV to say things, but they'll skirt around afraid to face what's there for fear they'll lose their platform and their influence. Let the church be the church. Wake up, the mighty man. Wake up! Be strong in dunamu. In Jude with the dunamis of God. Put on, be clothed into the whole armour of God. Be strong in the Lord, in the power, the, 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 the uh, kratos, the eruptive dominion of his power and the ischus, the forceful might of his power. Put on, be clothed into the full armour that you might stand against the wiles, the methods, the methodology of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, dominions world rulers, wicked spirits, pneumaticus paneros, wicked, malevolent, vile spirits. And then it says, wherefore, take up. You know what that word is? Analambano. Seize it. Get it on. It's a word to the body of Christ right now. Analambano. Seize the weaponry and put it on. While there's time. This is the greatest opportunity for any Christian that ever existed on the planet who'd been born into the finest hour. 
My family's all military. All military. My great uncle led a charge in Beersheba, second in command, and a charge in Beersheba that 800 men on horseback rode into the face of 5,000 in trenches with machine guns and artillery. And they took the famous wells, Abraham's wells at Beersheba and saved an army of 50,000 British that were coming in to take the place out of the Ottoman hands. He then led a charge into Damascus, taking 11,000 prisoners, field guns and took the whole battalion that was there out. Got the Distinguished Service Order and Bar. And I looked it up. He went into Gallipoli as a buck private. Seven months later, he was a major. Within, within 12 months, he was, leading a, he was leading a light horse division. And two years after the war, he was a major general. I said, Father, I want to do that with you. I'm going to finish. It's a place of lightnings. Flashes of lightning. When, when God speaks, lightning flashes. Spend enough time in there and we'll catch the lightnings of God. The Bible says we've been baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. You know the word for fire? Lightning fire. One flash of lightning. 48,000 degrees Celsius. Five times hotter than the sun. Enough power in one flash of lightning to pick a family car up and throw it 62 miles in the air. And God says, you're baptized with lightning fire. I want something to flash out of me, Pastor. I want anointing to flash out of me. We're going to pray for your daughter today. We're going to pray for a flash of lightning fire. My God. I'm closing this now. John G. Lake said, you talk about voltage of heaven and the power of God. Why there's lightning in the soul of Jesus and the lightning of Jesus heals men by its flash. Sin dissolves. Disease and demons flee when the lightning power of God approaches. A man came into one of his meetings and closing with this. He had a big typhoid sore on his, on his stomach. Massive, ugly thing, bathing it every day, infected, foul typhoid sore. Lifted up his shirt. John G. Lake took one look and put his hand flat on that cursed thing. And he said, in the name of Jesus, burn it out by the lightnings of God. That's how we pray. I don't want to lay dead hands on people. I want, to, I want something to come like a bolt that'll burn out of cancer. He put his hand flat on that thing. They contacted him two days later. They said, John, the thing's gone. But we can't explain a painless burn mark, the exact shape of your hand, a quarter of an inch deep. And it stayed there for days. Painless. <laughs> We're carriers of divine fire. There is hungry people here today. There are hungry people here in this meeting. I can see it. I can feel it. A brother from Holland, would you come? I want to pray for you. A gentleman on the edge of the seat over there, would you come, sir? Right on the end, second row, second row, second row, right there. Would you come? Are you hungry, my brother behind him? That's, are you hungry? Well, come on up. 